Moors Railway. One of the best known freight lines in the northeast was from Tyne Dock to Consett, where there was a massive ironworks. The line had had a passenger service until 1955 at the Consett end, but had been a dedicated freight line since then. Heavy ore trains had been operated by Northeastern Railway Class Q7 three cylinder 080s and LNER 01 280s. The 27 mile line was heavily graded in the direction loaded trains had to take as they carried iron ore up from Tyne Dock to Consett, situated high on the eastern side of the Pennines. The principal problem was the nine-mile climb from Austin through Anfield Plain, with its gradients of between 1 in 65 and 1 in 35. Following an expansion of the plant's capacity in the early 50s, the Tyne Improvement Commission, BR and the Concert Company had instituted a form of merry-go-round operation of the ore trains. For these, a batch of Class 9Fs had been specially fitted with air pumps to operate the brakes and discharge doors of the dedicated hopper wagons. These were run in three fixed brakes of nine wagons and a brake van, which weighed nearly 800 tons, and up to 10 trains a day would be run, with a 9F at each end. More LNER locomotives are seen at Bridgetown Central on the Scottish region on the eastern side of Glasgow, where the newly erected 25 kilovolt overhead catenary heralded the end of steam suburban working in the city. This was the second phase of the famous Glasgow Blue Trains electrification, which was inaugurated on the 29th of May 1962. Steam had had one brief reprieve when the first part of this scheme had been inaugurated and withdrawn. But this was to presage the end of steam suburban workings in Scotland. By contrast, Scotland had a number of long, straggling main lines which served sparsely populated country, prime targets for beaching. Most notable was the Waverley route from Edinburgh to Carlisle which outlasted steam but only just. It closed in 1969. Scotland also had many branches serving small communities, which were under review at the beginning of the decade. One such was the Killin branch, a short line which ran from the Callender and Oban line at Killin Junction alongside Loch Tay. Closure came in 1965. A rather more positive note had been struck at the end of the 50s when the North British Glen Douglas was restored to its pre-grouping livery. The Scottish region had retained an example of each of the principal Scottish companies' locomotives, together with two Caledonian coaches for use on rail tours, a most notable public relations exercise. The coaches are seen here behind a North British Class J36060 during the 1960 Scottish Rail Tour, which visited many of the branches and lines then under threat. The British Railway's standard classes had been a godsend for the Scottish region's former LMS lines. The Class 4s are seen on the Port Road from Dumfries to Stranraer, which stretched across the southwestern part of Scotland. The branches went in 1964, and the main line, condemned by Beeching, went in 1965. Boat trains to Stranraer Harbour for the Irish traffic were diverted to take the long loop via Ayr and Kilmarnock. As with all closures, many steam locomotives lost their duties. In this case, the small class of British Railway Standard Class 6 Pacifics, the Clans, were made redundant. The first standard class to be eliminated. At the beginning of the decade, there were many pre-grouping classes still in existence in Scotland. Over a hundred of these Caledonian 060 jumbos remained in 1961, although all were gone by 1964. The great Scottish company's entire stock being eliminated by the end of 1964, when the final Pickersgill goods engines went. <laughs>
Thereafter, the only evidence of Scottish railway history remained in the form of track and buildings. But the beaching cuts and closures would ensure that it was a very much smaller Scottish region that finally dispensed with steam in the summer of 1967. A rebuilt Bullard Pacific may seem an odd choice to commence a review of steam on the London Midland region, the final British Railways region to eliminate steam. The locomotive is seen on Midland petals at Leicester London Road Station on the Midland Main Line in the course of rail tour duties, an example of the many imaginative itineraries that were promoted in the 1960s, taking locomotives to parts of the system they had never been seen on before. It's followed by a native, one of the LMS-built versions of the classic Midland 4F060 design. This locomotive symbolizes the rapid elimination of steam, since it was virtually an obsolete design when built in the 1920s. Yet here it was, surviving almost to the end, alongside the far more modern designs which would, in the normal course of events, have been expected to have replaced it. The British Railway's Class II tanks were the kind of locomotives which would have replaced the 4Fs. They were a development of the LMS's own final local passenger design, the Ivert Class II tanks. The word development is probably a little strong, as they were really the same as the Ivert engines with some BR standard fittings. Like all the BR standards, they had foreshortened lives, as the spate of closures at the beginning of the decade, followed by the beaching cuts, meant they were rapidly put out of a job. These engines are seen leaving Leicester on their way to work on the well-known branch along the southeastern edge of Rutland, between Seaton Junction and Stanford in Lincolnshire, together with examples of the earlier IVAT version. The branch itself passed through delightful countryside and had one intermediate station at Moorcott before joining the ex-Midland line from Melton Mowbray to Peterborough at Luffenham. Its history and eventual closure was a familiar story in the post-beaching era. It was the product of Victorian rivalry between the LNWR and Midland Railway and had originally been part of the former's rugby to Stamford line, which had used running powers over the Midland. A desire to reach Peterborough led to a new direct line, making the Stamford line a branch. But Beeching's elimination of duplicate routes was to see both the new line and the branch close in June 1966. As ever, push-pull trains and the LMS and BR standard tanks were scrapped. LNWR lines in North Wales were also the haunts of the LMS and BR tanks, which had eventually completely replaced the various LNWR 242 and 062 tanks whose progress we have followed throughout this series. This domination was to be short-lived. The combined effect of a massive program of investment in diesel multiple units and the closure of the railways for which they were ordered meant that steam replacement on local services was accelerated. Cairnarvon would keep its passenger services until the end of the decade. But the Amluk branch, which had been dieselized in 1956, reversed the trend, steam returning from Christmas 1961 until the line's beaching-inspired closure exactly three years later. Another LNWR class whose progress we have charted throughout this series is the famous Super D 080 mineral type. In the light of the history of that great railway's locomotives under the LMS, it's not surprising that these were the only LNWR locomotives to work on British railways in the 1960s. Like the early Britons, they retreated to the Welsh hills where they shared duties on the Central Wales line with their successors and the BR standards. But by the beginning of 1964, there were only five left out of the original 502 engines. All would be gone by the end of the year. One would be kept for the national collection, a fitting example of the LNWR's great tradition a railway whose heritage had received scant attention. <laughs>
The Central Wales line also remains today, but Beeching and all his cost-cutting successes have tried to close it. It was to be singled and reduced to a diesel multiple unit run basic railway. In 1961, a DMU on the LNWR main line in central Birmingham crosses the Midland main line near Sortley as the Pines Express, before it was diverted away from the Somerset and Dorset, heads north behind the Black Five. Another member of the same class is banked by a 4F towards Camp Hill. The latter class would not be extinguished until 1966. The same Black Five is next seen entering Warsaw Station with the Pines, having virtually circumnavigated Birmingham. The chocolate and cream coach is virtually the only sign of Western region influence on the S&P's trains. But an ominous shape of things to come is symbolically waiting to take over from the Black Five. Earlier, we saw how former Great Western lines in the Birmingham district were decimated in the 1960s after they had been transferred to the London Midland region. The LMR's own inheritance of services and lines fared a little better, but many of those which served villages and communities outside the main metropolitan sprawl were to be cut back under beaching and before. Upon nationalization, the Midlands Birmingham to Bristol main line had fallen within the western region. But in 1958, lines north of Barnt Green reverted to the LMR. In a form of quid pro quo, the licky avoiding route from Barnt Green via Redditch and Evesham to Ashchurch was proposed for complete closure under Beeching. Passenger services from the south to Redditch having already ceased whilst the report was drawn up. Wiser councils prevailed, and it was reduced to a stump to Redditch from the 31st of July, 1964. The Cotswolds town of Evesham lost its direct route to Birmingham by these measures, and the Fowler 264 tanks, which had dominated services, were all to be withdrawn by 1966. With freight traffic in decline and the introduction of diesels on the direct main line, it was no longer necessary to keep an avoiding line for the Licky. But, as we saw in the last volume of this series, it wasn't until the 1990s that banking up the notorious incline could be eliminated. On the Midlands main line to London in the Leicester area, we see freights headed by an 8F and 9Fs. These powerful machines had eventually eliminated the Midlands Ponchon for double heading, but the railway was still bedeviled with the inheritance of short four-wheeled wagons in the 1960s. Traffic was declining rapidly, and Beeching proposed to eliminate many types of freight traffic, concentrating on long-haul block trains for future growth. The combination of all these changes was catastrophic for the steam railway as the closures of branches and local stations, the reductions of goods traffic, and the introduction of diesels and electrics all combined to eliminate steam and its infrastructure. Even modern steam locomotive types rapidly became obsolete under these pressures. The main lines were almost as much affected by beaching as the secondary ones, as the closure of wayside stations eliminated much work. The West Coast main line between Lancaster and Carlisle was to have all but two stations closed, only Oxenholm and Penrith remaining. Refuge sidings and the extra pairs of tracks for freight services on quadruple main lines became redundant when most of the freight was no longer there and what remained travelled at passenger train speeds. Lines such as the Great Central, which had relied on freight for its main revenue, could no longer be justified on passenger traffic alone and were closed. By the beginning of the 60s, it was a purely local line, as the LMR had diverted its expresses away in the late 50s. But they were to transfer some of the superb rebuilt in Scotia to eke out their days on local passenger trains. 
displaced by diesels and electrics from the West Coast Main Line, they were to be withdrawn between 1962 and 1965. Their final condition mirrored that of most steam engines from 1963 onwards, as they ran unkempt and devoid of their nameplates. The Great Central was to become the last haunt of a number of famous classes in the 60s, as, with closure expected, there were no plans to equip it with diesels. The LNER V2s and the various standard classes, 460s for passenger and 9Fs for freight, were to be its final new motor power. As the changes accelerated throughout the decade, steam sheds took on a different appearance. This is Carlisle's famous Kingmore shed, apparently still a hive of activity, with its 8Fs, Britannias and 9Fs all ready for the road. But behind the scenes was a more depressing sight. Rows upon rows of redundant express engines awaiting the scrapman's call. All the famous names were here, from Jubilees to Scots, the march of modernization claiming many victims, witnessed by the yellow stripes on the cab sides, which indicated steam locomotives banned from running under the wires. The wires were the manifestation of the major plank of the 1955 modernization plan, electrification of the West Coast Main Line. The first part was completed at the beginning of our decade, crew to Manchester being switched on in 1960, with the overhead continually gradually extending to Liverpool, down the main line to Euston, and round the loop through Birmingham by March 1967. All this had a profound effect on the steam locomotive fleet and on the railwaymen themselves. Often forgotten is the way the modernization scheme didn't just eliminate locomotives, stations and railways. Tens of thousands of jobs were to go, with the inevitable loss of morale and pride in the job. Many traditional ranks, such as cleaners, no longer existed, with the result that locomotives quickly became covered in filth. Soot-encrusted steam engines running over lines which would soon be closed or be downgraded to stations without staff were not an attractive way to travel. This all became self-perpetuating as passengers turned away from the dirty railway in ever-increasing numbers, and the vicious spiral continued to gather momentum. The very nature of steam production from coal was conducive to the emission of soot and dirt, and the elimination of all forms of steam power was an objective of government in the 1960s. The railways were just part of this wider field. The massive infrastructure required to support the steam locomotive, with its maintenance and running sheds frequently sited in the hearts of towns and cities, was a considerable overhead. The closure of sheds such as this one at Rugby would release land which could either be sold off to boost the railway's dwindling funds or convert it into car parks to cater for the changing needs of those customers it could still attract. It was to be a long and hard road, but an inevitable one. The stark fact was that by the 1960s, the steam locomotive was no longer a viable proposition for everyday use. The London Midland region was to be the very last bastion of steam on British railways, its carefully integrated steam fleet being run down through most of the decade. The most notable victims of the electrification were to be the much revered Stania Pacifics, withdrawal of which began with the Princesses in 1961 and 62. The latter year was to see the first Duchesses withdrawn a true indication that the need to eliminate steam had overtaken the original phased replacement of the modernization plan. Had that scheme been followed, the duchesses wouldn't have become redundant until the full electrification from Houston to Crewe had been completed. But a very short-term plan replaced them with diesels from 1962 onwards. All would be gone by 1964, three years early.
Black Five, reversing under the wires, takes us to Crewe, the heart of the LNWR and LMS, as well as West Coast electrification. The famous junction was to see the transition from steam to diesel to electric, remaining the hub of the system. The story of many locomotive classes was to end here, and it was the lack of political will and funding that was to result in the last stronghold of steam in Great Britain being the main lines north of Crewe. Although the wires ran north from Crewe to Liverpool, the main line beyond Weaver Junction to Glasgow was deemed too expensive for electrification in the 60s, the wires having to wait until the next decade. As a result, many of the LMS standard classes, such as the Jubilees, would see their lives continued until 1968. And this Jubilee is 45684 Jutland. The application of the yellow cab side stripe doesn't appear to have been consistently applied, and many steam engines continued to work under the wires. The Jubilees were the last survivors of the former 5XP class, by now 6P of course. The Patriots having all been withdrawn between 1960 and 1962. The end of steam also saw the end of pre-grouping coaching stock, as BR had built large numbers of standard Mark I coaches, which were more than sufficient in number for remaining services. The rundown of the 8P Pacifics was completed in 1964, when the last of the Duchesses were retired. Surprisingly, none was included in the national collection of significant locomotives, but one, City of Birmingham, went to the museum in its namesake city. The great holiday king, Billy Butlin, had seen the rundown of steam as a source of added attractions for his seaside resort camps, so he purchased two of the redundant Duchesses. The attraction waned in later years, and they were made available for display elsewhere, and eventual resale. Thus, by this convoluted route, the gap in the national collection was made good, and the Duchess of Hamilton has become the flagship of the National Railway Museum at York. The first numbered but not first built Black Five and Royal Scott 460s were to be retained for the collection. It's an interesting coincidence that neither deserves its place by virtue of originality. Both are, of course, valuable in their own right. None of the smaller standards would be retained, although the little class four moguls were probably the epitome of the classic British mixed traffic type. The last LMS built Pacific is seen at Preston at the end of her days. Ivat had produced two modified versions of Stania's Great Duchesses in 1947. On their completion, it was announced that they had been built with a view to comparing them directly with the two mainline diesels that were built at the same time. The latter were numbers 10,000 and 10,001, the first British mainline diesels. The result of the contest was never revealed, but by 1964, Diesels had ousted the Duchesses over Shap. The picturesque Pennines would be amongst the last haunts of the British steam locomotive. The last crabs were withdrawn during 1967, at the end of which steam was eliminated from the main line over Shap. Thereafter, steam was only to be seen on the other routes in Lancashire, as it worked into its final year. As 1968 dawned, 8Fs, a few standards, and perhaps most appropriate of all, a number of black fives were left. The work was traditional. There were still plenty of classic short wheelbase wagons, but they would soon follow the locomotives into oblivion. All the Britannias had been transferred to the LMR, and all but one would be withdrawn before the end came, when 70013 Oliver Cromwell headed the last British Railway steam train on the 11th of August, 1968. It then joined the National Collection and went to Bressingham. After that, it seemed the only place for a steam engine was on a plinth. Billy Butlin certainly thought so, although, as we've already related, he would later release them. This Duchess would also end up at Bressingham with Oliver Cromwell. Her companion at air, a Brighton Terrier, came too. For most steam engines, the destination was the scrapyard and oblivion.
However, unbeknownst to those who mourned its passing, among the weeds of Woodham's Brothers Scrapyard in Barry, South Wales, there lay the seeds of the great preservation movement of the future, and many more decades of steam. But the Barry miracle wasn't even in the dreams of the 60s enthusiasts. They saw the future in the preservation of a few locomotives direct from BR service. Foremost amongst the active purchasers was Patrick Whitehouse, whose railway roundabout programs on the BBC had done so much to record the last days of steam. Together with a group of like-minded friends, he set up the Birmingham Railway Museum at Tysley and purchased the last active Great Western Castle class locomotive, 7029 Clun Castle. From 1965 to 1967, Clun was used on many rail tours, some taking her to places which had never previously seen castles, including Carlisle. Another private purchaser was Lord Lindsay, who bought the last Gresley K4 mogul, the Great Marquis. This also broke much new ground, such as the southern region. One of the most popular public appeals was to save a Gresley A4, and the locomotive chosen was the one which bore his name. But the most famous survivor of all was to be the last steam locomotive to work on British railways. Flying Scotsman was privately preserved by Alan Pegler, direct from service in 1963, with a 10-year agreement allowing her to run over British Railways networks. Like most of the other preserved engines, she was repainted in her pre-nationalisation livery and was fitted with an extra tender, as water supplies were no longer available. When steam ceased on the 11th of August 1968, BR imposed a complete ban on steam, but Alan Pegler's agreement stood firm. So, at the end of the 60s, Flying Scotsman was the only steam engine allowed on BR main lines. Who would have forecast any more decades of steam? <laughs> 